Good evening and thank you all for joining us to hear Daniel Nolan speak. Daniel's career in landscape design started by chance when he felt slightly dis disconnected from his studies in art school and began exploring courses in landscape design. His first project was at his parents' home in South Carolina, but that led quickly to neighbors require, requesting his, his um, services, and he was able to build a portfolio and became um, came to uh, California and was hired by Flora Garb, a, a renowned plants woman and nursery owner in San Francisco. He started in sales, working with customers and designing the store's plants displays. But when customers began requesting designs for their homes, it was he who set up the design apartment department within the store and began landscaping across the Bay Area. He created his own studio six years ago, and he now enjoys commissions across California. He's been named as one of the next generation of Bay Area designers by Architectural Design Digest, and the New York Times has described him as one of the landscapers in the world, redefining their craft. In his presentation this evening or this morning, depending where you're sitting, Daniel accompanies us on a tour of the San Francisco Bay Area with its multiple microclimates and growing zones and the ever-present requirement for water wisdom. We visit several projects where he discusses his design philosophy, his favorite plant combinations and why he'll never be a fan of the color red. Thank you so much, Daniel, for being with us this evening. If you would like to share your screen now. So, um, just leading this into the presentation again, um, we have to sort of discuss what is the Bay Area look like. Um, the Bay Area has multiple microclimates, multiple zones across it. Just being based in San Francisco, we experience a rather temperate climate. Um, that's because we're surrounded mostly by water. So our range in temperatures are pretty small. Um, you know, Celsius, you're talking about um, only about 21 degrees in the summer, and then sort of the winter high being around 16 degrees. So something rather, you know, limited. Then you go further north, and this would be up into the Napa Valley region and you would be getting much hotter temperatures around 32 degrees in the summer, and then around 16 degrees uh, as a high in the winter. The same is mirrored on the southern part of the Bay. So we do really experience quite a large range um, within the Bay Area and exploring the different micro microclimates as well as the soil conditions is a big part of gardening in the Bay Area. It's, it's quite challenging. So here's just a list of Bay Area microclimates. And then we're going now into the first garden. So the first garden here is located in Calistoga. This would be 75 miles north of San Francisco. Um, this property is a true Mediterranean climate that I think that we're all very familiar with. Um, so very hot, dry summers, and then very wet, cool winters. Um, this property here is a winery called Clopagas. And what was interesting about this project is that it used to completely be a front lawn, and we removed it um, as part of a program within the state of California to give up sort of water-hungry grasses and plant more drought-tolerant species. So this is a completely dry garden. Um, we had irrigation at the beginning, but we have turned it off because the plants simply don't need it anymore. Um, in the foreground, you can see those yellow spikes. Those are all Dazzlerian wheeloi, um, a plant from the American Southwest and Mexico that does very well and sort of we are at the top of the range for a lot of Mediterranean plants. If you go much further than Napa, um, you end up in a place that basically gets two cold winters where there may be snow or just very cold temperatures that kill off a lot of Mediterranean plants. So we were really sort of testing the limit of how far we could go. So that's why we did this plant. And then we also moved into 
the Jubea chilenensis. Uh, you can see them on the right and the left corner at the bottom of the screen, as well as more of the cold hardier plants and agaves. So we did agave francisinii. We also did Euphorbia resinura, which was quite challenging, but that Euphorbia is native to the mountains of Morocco. So we thought, let's give it a try and see if it works in Calistoga. Um, and it's actually done very well, been very successful. So we're quite pleased with that. Um, the unifying palette though is the olive trees that we brought in from different parts of the property and then amended some from another nursery. So the olive trees sort of combined with the, um, with the palms gives it a really truly Mediterranean experience. Here you can see the Dazzlerian wheelerai that's on the left. That has that sort of beige spike. We also combined it with my favorite plant species, which is the Xanthorea family. Um, this one is Xanthorea pressii, but you can see them with that same similar flower structure. Um, this plant is native to Australia. And I, it's a cousin really to a lot of these sort of um, you know, grass tree species like the Dazzlerian um, longissimum from Mexico. This one is Australian. So we feel like when the continents separated, there was obviously some lineage, but they've completely evolved separately. Daniel, I Daniel think... sorry to interrupt you. Somebody's just asking, what soil are you working on here? Which is quite, oh. uh, obviously, yeah. Uh, perhaps yeah, I can know. absolutely. So this is Napa. Um, so what's known about Napa is that it has wonderful well-draining soil, um, somewhat rocky. It's where most of the wineries are. So the soil is not particularly rich, um, but it does drain very well. Um, and I can talk about the soils in each of these different projects. Um, but we were very fortunate. We didn't have to do any soil amendment with this project. Um, if you dig deep, deep down, there is clay but you have to go pretty far. Um, the top layers are mostly, you know, pretty good in well draining soil. So all of these plants have really responded to those sort of conditions. Um, and then we'll go above the property. And this is the residence of the winery. So you can see California Mediterranean, <laughs> which is actually quite a lot of pine. It's quite a lot of oak. Um, we're a, one of the more like lusher corners of the Mediterranean region, just because in Northern California, we do start to sort of encroach into those temperate areas. So this is sort of where we lie. Um, the plant combinations up here are very similar to what we use down in the winery. You can see by the um, lawn chair area, we replaced a little patch of grass with a Demandia ground cover. Um, it's a silvery kind of wool surface um, that's become really great for small gardens and creeping between pavers or just, you know, if you have a compact space as a grass alternative. Um, on the left by the pool, you can see, I think, what is one of my favorite and maybe signature plantings for screen. Um, that is an acacia itiophila. So it is a silvery mounding sort of acacia. It doesn't really turn into a tree, but you can prune it into one if you want. It has a very wide sort of structure. So it can get about 12 to 15 feet wide and about that same height. So we planted a long slope um, to screen the sort of undesirable view of the base of the oaks. And now you have this feathery, silver, compact, evergreen foliage, which is really wonderful. Um, another plant that I use quite often is the Yucca Ristrata. I use them pretty much all over the place. Um, they work in almost every condition around the Bay Area. And you can see those in the right photograph um, on the left, or oh, sorry, on the right of the photo. Again, you'll always see silver in a lot of my projects. Um, Artemisia, this is the Powys Castle, which is, I think, a classic. Um, maybe a little overplanted, but it does really well to sort of unify big mass plantings. So that's just the, you know, it's the wormwood is the common name, but 
it's a really, really wonderful plant. Um, I used it underneath these dwarf olives that are fruitless, like everything in California, everyone's concerned about maintenance and I'm always getting requests for fruitless olives, although they're not actually my favorite. So here they are. And then let's go to the next one. You can see this is the back view onto the property. Um, I wish I had a better image, a close-up image of this um, little orange flower in the front. But what's really wonderful about it is this is a dikea. Um, it's a compact terrestrial bromeliad family, um, a plant in the bromeliad family. And what's really wonderful about it is they're small, so they won't really get more than a couple of inches or maybe even you know a foot high at max. But they produce this tubular orange flower that hummingbirds just go crazy for. And the flowers last really long, so maybe a month or two. Um, it's just a really wonderful plant and I wish more of them were available in the nursery trade. But when I see them, I snap them up and install them because they really are, are wonderful. And you do get a little bit of unexpected color. So this is the combination. Um, there's also a little bit of Dazzlerian longissimum in there underneath the olives, but you know, a really wonderful sight just based off of the location on top of a hill, well draining. Um, and then again, up here, there is no water. Um, everything has to be brought in in a truck and put into a tank. So this property is almost completely off water. Um, this is the courtyard. This is Gave Franzosinii. And what's interesting about this is there's only about six inches of actual planting um, soil in here. There's a concrete drain underneath this bed. So we filled it as much as we could with soil. We provided this, what was going to be a fountain, but everyone was complaining about the water being an issue. So we put cleister cactus into it and then just put barrel cactus around it and created a little dry garden within the court out of the property. Um, very successful. Basically only gets a couple hours of direct sun, which I think is helpful for not getting those um, agaves too much room to grow. But years later, it still looks almost just identical to this. The barrel cactus have grown a lot, but it still looks pretty, pretty good. This is the front of the property. Um, surprisingly, it's a very <laughs> sort of traditional combination of plants but it is the olives mixed with um, the rosemary and boxwoods. So boxwoods are the only things that are hand watered. The rest of the garden, we just sort of let it go and um, it's responding very well to just the winter rains. And then sometimes in the deep summer, if it gets really hot, we'll spray it with water. But here, this area gets roughly 90 degrees constantly during the summer. Um, and then it also gets occasional freezing spells. So we try to really be respectful of those plant limitations, um, but also deliver something that's a little more um, unusual. All right, so we're sort of moving south and to the east of the city. So this is the town of Orinda which is 25 miles east of San Francisco. Um, the conditions are a little bit more temperate than in Napa. But what's interesting about this is it does get pretty cold, but it also stays relatively warm um, almost all summer into the fall. So the temperature here gets to about, you know, um, I would say 70s, upper 70s in the summer, maybe 80s. And then it really doesn't go beneath, you know, 50s in the winter. So it's, we're pretty lucky. Um, frost here is very rare. But this garden had a really difficult site because the neighbor above us had a really intense garden and she refused to turn off her irrigation. So water was streaming off of her property into our property. And we were having this constant issue with the clients trying to grow grass or like a lawn and it failing. So what we did was 
I tore out the entire backyard, um, which was mostly grass and a few dead apple trees. And we installed a large meadow of Australian native plants, of mostly Australian native plants. So that grass that you're seeing in the front along the top of the wall is Lamandra. And it's called Lamandra Breeze. And it basically acts like a sponge. So the water that comes down the hill basically gets stopped by this grass and the grass has just sort of absorbed it um, and taken quite a lot of it up. This is the courtyard of the property on the left. In the background, this is a new podocarpus. Um, I use podocarpus quite a lot. This one is a little more compact and conifer looking. It's called Icy Blue. Um, it's a newish plant on the market, but I really love it. So this was just planted maybe six months to a few months before we shot. And right now it is completely grown in. Um, it just looks like a sort of pale blue podocarpus. Um, on the right photo, you can see the view leading up from the backyard into the garden. So on the right, underneath the bamboo, we planted something called Lamandra Tropic Bell, which gets a little bit thicker and a little bit taller. And then the right side is where we have two combinations of Westringia and the Lamandra, basically acting as that sponge for the water coming up from the neighbors above. Uh, also in that planter, that is called Agave Blue Glow. So it's one of my favorite agaves, doesn't get too big. It's really wonderful. So top of the hill, um, this is one of the combinations that we used of Lamandra. This is called Platinum Beauty. And this one is a silver, white, and green variegated grass. Um, gets very large, you know, I'm saying about four to five feet across. But what's really wonderful is it grows really quickly. It's evergreen. It's extremely low maintenance. And then behind it, we have, again, that acacia itiophylla. So you can see that silvery foliage. That little bit of yellow that you see is another acacia. That's acacia cultriformis that's in flower. And that has a very acid yellow, strong, you know, um, flower tone to it, but the Itiophylla is a much paler yellow when it does flower. So this actually created a lot of um, <laughs> screening and low maintenance for my clients who wanted to have a sort of space at the top of the hill where they could look at the rest of the property from. So that's where we, we resulted in this sort of combination. This is looking back from the home up the hill. So you see that stand of redwoods. That is what a lot of <laughs> well-meaning people planted, I feel like back in the 70s and 80s. What resulted in a lot of these creating rather difficult environments for other plants to grow. Um, they just get so large and they really do dominate. So we pulled back almost all the material close to those redwoods and then underplanted it with those acacias and then sloped towards the house with the rest of those lamandras. So you see the lamandra breeze at the top of the retaining wall. Um, this silver tree that you see on the right, is, or sorry, on the left, excuse me, is called acacia cavenii. Um, it's another acacia from coastal of Southern Australia. And I prefer it in a lot of cases to olives because they don't look really impressive going in, but within, this was maybe four years, something that's almost 15 feet to 20 feet high, depending on how you prune it. And they also have a really beautiful, wonderful structure. So you can get something that has a little bit more instant gratification, which isn't just olives, which I feel like you know, a lot of people are requesting, but there's a lot of other tree species out there that deserve attention. So this is why I went for the acacia. Um, another acacia species is this ground cover by the pool. This is called Cousin It. It's an acacia cognata, and it's a low growing, couple of feet tall by a couple of feet wide. So really wonderful plant. Let's keep going. 
going. All right. So now we're in San Francisco. Um, this is actually my garden. This is the view that I look down onto um, when I'm looking into my backyard. And what's interesting in San Francisco, and not a lot of people know this, is that when the Europeans came to discover or find San Francisco, were basically sand dunes is all they found. Um, we don't really have a lot of native plants. We're basically a artificial city on top of these dunes. So the soil conditions in San Francisco are pretty um, varied depending on what area you're in. Um, where I live in the center of the city, I have very well draining soil and it's very sandy still. So a lot of San Francisco in such a small area um, has some pretty interesting soil conditions. And a lot of it is either imported um, or it's basically just, you know, if you dig down a foot or two, it's just more sand. So I'm able to get away with a lot of tropical or semi-tropical plants in my backyard. This is south facing, um, but we're also protected by three buildings. So I'm able to grow plants like Monstera, Pisonias, um, Scheffleras outside, and they do really well. And this is no irrigation. This just gets sprayed with um, a hose every couple of months, basically, or sorry, every couple of weeks. Um, and then the same goes for my backyard, which has basically a staghorn collection with a few boxwoods. And then pretty mild and has a lot of moisture in it. So we're pretty lucky in that. One thing particularly about San Francisco is that because we're such a small city, uh, we don't have a lot of room. So we look down into our gardens a lot. Um, we sort of build up and then look down. So a lot of this comes into play when I'm designing gardens. A lot of my clients are like, you know, I want have all these grand expectations for a garden, but you know, 50 to 90% of the time, they're just looking down on them from above. So similar to my garden, I approach my designs with a similar, uh, similar philosophy. So here we did a lot of plants like palms. You see the queen palms in front and then along the back of the fence, underplanted with things like the Australian tree ferns. Um, these are plants that we can grow almost throughout the entirety of San Francisco, the east parts of the East Bay and further south. But if you were to go further out towards Prince Napa or towards San Jose, south of the city, you can't grow those plants. Um, it simply gets too, too hot and then too cold. So within the Mediterranean climate, you know, we do have these little pockets where we can get away with things that just aren't possible elsewhere. So plants like, you know, Australian tree ferns and the queen palms had a lot of interest, but also um, are very hardy for our part of San Francisco. Here you can see them. Here's the combination together. Um, this combination is the queen palms in the back. You have the Australian tree ferns beneath. You have the unifying, um, you can see the acacia cousin it at the bottom. And then that agave is actually not an agave attenuata, but it's called agave attenuata blue flame. Um, and what's interesting about this is it's similar to an agave attenuata, but it's a little bit tougher. Um, and it doesn't have that sort of foxtail flower that's so dramatic. So I really prefer it. Um, I, it's a very cold hardy um, agave if people are wanting to do something that's similar to agave attenuata. So one of my favorites. And then the rest is a mixture of just some, this is some salvia. Um, I believe that is, I believe it's black and blue. Um, it's one of the Mexican salvias that have done very well in our cooler climates. And then in the very front, you'll see this philodendron xanet, or 
well, I think it's saloon. So this is the giant leafed philodendron. So this is a garden that could not be planted around a lot of parts of the Bay Area, um, particularly just because of the climate, but it does very well. <clears throat> this is another range that we're also fortunate to get. Um, this is also in San Francisco. So this is an almost completely dry garden, no irrigation at all. You can see the yellow flowers. Um, on the right, it is Acacia cultureformis with an agave angustifolia marginata underneath. And then on the left, you can see the Acacia bormani. So it has a thinner um, leaf structure to it and then a much sort of frothier mimosa flower. Then underneath we have again, you can see some of the agave blue glows, some Kalanchoe berhanensis, and varieties of potted succulents and cactus. So we're very fortunate um, because of our cooler temperatures, we don't get drastic heat, but we also don't get cold temperatures. We're able to plant things like this um, with a lot of success. So here's another photo. You can see also some Fucrea mixed in there. Um, you know, this is just a very drought tolerant and sort of plant it and leave it garden. This client did not want to be, um, <laughs> I don't want to use his exact words, but he didn't want to be out in the garden all the time working. So this is, this was our solution. Daniel, excuse very me. Very low maintenance. Sorry to interrupt you again. Um, are you, have you got your um, pointer on? Um, yes, Are you? Can. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Because I think it would be useful. To, I. I can't. I was seem to be missing it. Maybe I'm okay. Yes. Now I can see it. Sorry. To, sorry to interrupt. Thank you. Okay. So you can yes, see the. Um, so you can see these. Um, these are the agaves that I was talking about. So next photo. Again, we're still in San Francisco. Um, the interesting thing is now we've sort of combined these two plant palettes. So this is a bed that has agave desmitiana in it. And then it also has this casuarina, which is called present it. Casuarina is from Australia. It's called the she oak. Um, some are shrubs, some are trees. This one is a ground cover. So this will cascade over this concrete wall. And then behind it, you have the spineless Apuntia, which is called Apuntia elisiana. You can see a little bit better of a view here, stag horns on the wall. And then also here is that same Apuntia with this agave and then the agave desmitiana in the foreground. So quite successful. And then this is the sort of Mediterranean garden that I think a lot of us are familiar with. So it's a combination of citrus. Um, we also have the artichoke, but these are cardoons. And then some of these euphorbia. And this is just this kind of aggressively um, self-seeding. This is euphorbia wolfenii that just sort of pops up all over the garden that my client loves. And then what's interesting is they really wanted some some scent and texture. So I underplanted it with this really wonderful peppermint scented pelargonium. So this is the ground cover that has this sort of fuzzy green foliage, white flowers, and then a really strong fragrance. And then if you're interested, this sort of sculptural um, agave plant is actually not an agave. This is a fucrea. Um, it's a variegated fucrea and it stays relatively small, um, just a couple of feet tall and wide, does really well in Bay Area gardens. So quite successful. And then these are photos that I just took of a project that I did um, for a building that has almost zero maintenance plan, but it did very well. So this is the same agave, or excuse me, <laughs> excuse me, the same Fucrea that I was talking about in the other garden. And then behind it also has my favorite signature agave, with, uh, excuse me, yucca ristrata behind it. 
This is the Kleistocactus, this sort of silver torch cactus here, and then a cashmere cypress. So this was just a combination of about six different plants. Um, these junipers were existing and we didn't want to lose them. So we just basically introduced this combination of five plants, repeated it down an entire city block, and it's been extremely um, tough, resilient, and grown in really beautifully. Again, this now gets no irrigation except for the cashmere cypress. So just a little bit of water during the summer months, but you know, really nothing during the winter. So very fortunate there. This is another garden. I'm going to go pretty quickly through just because the photo quality wasn't great on this. But again, San Francisco gardens, you look down into your gardens more than you actually inhabit them. Um, that's just the reality here. So this garden, we took out um, a lot of kind of European plants that weren't doing well, a lot of birches, um, a lot of hellebores, things like that, which I usually love, but were kind of the wrong uh, situation for this garden. So you can see the yucca restratas in the corners here. And then we did cascading rosemary prostrata with also some of this silvery texture in the back, which is actually a kalanchoe. This is called kalanchoe rose leaf. Um, it's done very well, but it doesn't get huge. It doesn't sort of turn into that berhanensis, you know, monster that's sort of kind of scraggly as it grows. It's much more compact. You can see it here at the bottom of the photo. Um, in this container, we have a xanthorea. And then the next photo, you can see a little bit more of this would be the view looking from the downstairs um, into the garden. Again, here's that signature acacia itiophylla in the back along the property. And then just a really soft uh, planting of the rosemary. And then also this is heliochrysum um, in the corner here, also in the upper corner here. So um, what's interesting about this, a really, I would say, limited number of plants, um, but quite successful. I just wish the photo quality had turned out a little bit better, but here we go, another view. Oh, also one of my favorite plants. This is an olive, but it's called um, olive, well, Olea little Ollie, and it is the compact dwarf olive. So it's, I would suggest it as a replacement for like a boxwood, or if you want that sort of formal, kind of clipped shape, you can clip it into that. If you leave it on its own, it'll get sort of much more wild and kind of um, natural looking, but yeah, it's it's a really wonderful plant. It can take a lot of shaping and just does really well in the city or in Mediterranean gardens around here. And then this, this is, I think one of my last um, city projects. So this client um, really wanted palms and really wanted a lot of texture um, and not a lot of flowers. So what we did was we imported these two trachycarpus. This is Fortunii. And a lot of people, why I brought this in is that a lot of people leave the furry trunks and I wanted to skin them. So you can remove that sort of furry coating um, around the base of the trunk and reveal this smooth trunk, which was similar to the Washingtonia that was already on site. So by bringing these two in, um, we were able to sort of achieve a little bit of the same dimension, but also make it look like it was intentional. So sort of setting up these corners. In the back, you have these giant birds of paradise. And then in the front, you have a small combination of, these are a budia on both sides here. And then this is one of my favorite plants. This is a Dorianthes palmeri from Australia. So you can see, here's another Dorianthes. It's a really spectacular plant. It does have a red flower that's disappointing. I really can't stand it, but it's quite dramatic when it blooms and then we cut it off. So my clients really love it, but for me, it's much more about the texture and the scale of it um, as opposed to the flower. But 
does very, very well. And then we put it in a backyard planting of some philodendron. This is some more Fucrea. This is Fucrea fetida. And then this is Dracaena Draco on the left-hand side. So a garden that really doesn't get a lot of, um, I would say it gets used, but it's mostly a garden, like I said, you look down onto. So you don't really go into the garden that often, but you know, quite successful when you do approach it from this level. All right. So now we are into the coast. Um, so this is maybe, I would say, a couple of blocks from the ocean. This area of Moss Beach is 25 miles south of San Francisco. And the interesting thing about it is, is that it really does not get very hot or very cold. So the temperatures around there are gonna be roughly um, upper 60s, maybe 70s in the summer. And then in the winter, you know, kind of around the 60s and 50s. So a very, very temperate uh, climate that's controlled mostly because of the moisture and the climate off the coast. But we really are able to grow quite a lot of things here. The only issue is that it is pure sand. So here we are looking at plants that are a lot of California natives, but also mixed with Australian coastal plants that have done very well for our climate. So I'll point out the, um, the California natives. This is our native salvia. This is Alan Chickering that has this purple flower. And then we also have this ground cover Cianothus. I believe this is Yankee Point. Um, what's really wonderful though, is that this will also produce a small lavender flower. Um, and that will bloom in like maybe February or March. And then in the summer, you'll get the purple flowers of this um, salvia alan chickering and the fragrance off of it is really wonderful. What we also have here on the right is a hedge of acacia cultureformis. So we planted about four of these across and it's grown in well, but you know, just a very low maintenance garden, um, because again, this is a client that doesn't want to do a lot of gardening and wants to sort of have a hands-off approach. Uh, so in the foreground, another Australian plant, which is the Restringia. And I believe this one is um, Highlight, or no, excuse me, Morning Light. So this is a variegated, um, I believe it's called Australian Rosemary or Coastal Rosemary, but it's from Australia. It has a similar texture to, um, I would say, yeah, kind of rosemary looking foliage but um, does very well. And I actually think does a little bit better than most rosemaries um, throughout the Bay Area. Then this is the side view. Um, again, Acacia itiophylla. This tree right here is a Banksia. So uh, this is an Australian native, produces, um, instead of a very typical flower, it looks almost like a modified pine cone. The hummingbirds love it. Um, it's very interesting. It has this really beautiful silver glaucous underside to the leaf. But what's really wonderful is that it grows really quickly, particularly along the coast. And where we couldn't really get an olive tree to grow here because it's so cold. And most oak trees also wouldn't be able to put up with this sort of exposure. It has the best qualities of both of those trees. So it has that sort of um, elliptical leaf of an, of an olive but then it also has the sort of habit of an oak as it grows. So a really, really wonderful tree. And then I, would, I want to point out this bush, these two bushes in the corner, these are Koreas. These are Australian fuchsias. So what's wonderful about this is that driving by, you would think it's a boxwood. Um, it has a very natural rounded shape and then produces a yellowish kind of um, chartreuse flower, which is really spectacular, but the foliage is just really wonderful. Um, and then I probably will get yelled at by some native plant person. This is a pompous grass, but it is not the invasive species. This is a Cordideria, I believe it's called Silver Comet. 
I am unable to find them anymore, but it's beautiful. Um, it has this really, really wonderful, um, lightly variegated foliage, almost pure silver, produces the same flowers, but really, really wonderful. And um, we have such an issue with the invasive pompous grass all over the coast. Um, it was interesting to <laughs> go to a nursery and pick one out because um, everyone's on a mission to remove them. So I was really excited when I saw these and was able to put them into this mix of plants. And then we'll look at the backyard. Um, so this is taken quickly after we planted this, but we did a series of these xanthoreas. So we planted about nine of these xanthoreas in the backyard um, to sort of create a sort of ground cover effect. And then we planted as well these acacia cavanias, which are sort of doing that sort of olive tree structure above. So just a really, really successful combination, but also two plants from the same continent and from the same growing um, conditions, which is coastal Australia. So really, really wonderful. And again, this is pure sand. Um, so you dig down more than a foot or two and you're just you know, completely on top of the dune. So we didn't have to amend the soil much, but it was very, very successful. And then to the right, this is actually a protocarpus that's done very well. So quite happy with this. Again, you can see the combination. This is that acacia. This is the xanthorea. This is lamandra, same Australian family. So basically all Australians. And then with more uh, Australian and South African plants, this is a leucodendron galpinii, cicacia, and then these are agaves, um, marginata, oops, sorry, angustifolia marginata from Mexico. So very successful. All right. Um, so now we're at the bottom of the peninsula, um, the bottom of the Bay Area, and this is Menlo Park, where we have two projects. Um, this was a combination of, these are sago palms in the front with yucca restaurants. And then this is another lamandra that we used. This one is called Nayala. It's a little bit more compact, um, very, very tough, and has a little bit of a tougher ble uh, leaf to it. And then mixed in, we also did these anaxanthus. So these are kangaroo paws. So it's an interesting combination of um, sago palms, which are you know, Asian, uh, Chinese, and Japanese, but then mixed in with a lot of Australian plants, the Lamandra, the Anagazanthus, and then these are two bracket crichtons. Um, these are museum or Queensland bottle trees. So this is bracket crichton cerfolia, and um, just a really wonderful tree. We are still. Um, trying to import more bracket crichtons because a lot is being learned about them and how well they do in the Bay Area. So my client was excited to get them and they look quite lovely. And then this is actually the side yard. Um, what's interesting is we were trying to screen the street and we did a combination of some California natives, which is America, which is sort of hidden here on the left and then we did these, this is again, that Banksia uh, integrifolia. You can see that sort of silver foliage standing out. And then underneath, we did a South African native. This is a Leucospermum high gold. So it has this really wonderful foliage, very geometric, but then these acid yellow flowers coming off with then the sago palms in the background. So really wonderful combination of plants, but just, um, yeah, very, very, very hardy for this area. Also, the soil around here, pretty heavy. Um, there does seem to be a lot of clay. So whenever we were planting these leucospermums, we really did amend the soil just to make sure that they weren't getting um, waterlogged. But in the summer, really just do some supplemental watering, but between I would say November and April, we completely cut off the irrigation and this just sort of takes care of itself. So quite wonderful. Down here, it does get a little bit hotter. So we are able to get away with um, some plants that 
do need a little bit more to that would be, for instance, like the Sagos, they respond a lot better. And then also we have, um, this is a Grevillea Moonlight on the left, um, which has a very feathery foliage with a white flower. It does very well in the peninsula. And then you're going to see in the next photo, this is again, that sort of signature, I guess, Acacia Itiophila hedge. So really, really wonderful. And then here on the right is the same photo, but just a little bit more close up xanthus with these um, brachycritons. And then this should be the final project. Um, this is a combination of Fucrea mcdouglii, so it's these three here, underplanted with these agave blue flame. So it was a very simple combination. And then underneath is just a sedum. Uh, it's called sedum angelina. And then we planted these two dwarf olives on the right of the house. So a really simple and striking combination. Um, when the house was done, the, <laughs> the soil around the property was so bad um, because they had basically just ruined it during the construction process, just dumping like remnants of stucco and concrete and all sorts of things that we were really limited by what we could do in this space, um, particularly in the front. So instead of going for a more lush approach um, and really having to remove all the soil, we kind of said, let's just work with what we were given. And this was the combination that we came up with. So quite successful. Um, in the backyard though, a little bit of a different story. So we were trying to cut down on the amount of lawn but the client did have children at the time, young children, so we did need to have some. But what we did was we removed quite a bit and we installed these two Phoenix Dactylifera. Um, what's interesting about these Dactylifera is that we can't really plant them successfully in San Francisco, we're too temperate. And then in Napa, we're too cold. So if you go more into the South Bay where it's going to be a little bit hotter um, and not as, well, I would say more mild during the winter, we're able to get, get away with species like this down there. So the Phoenix Dactylifera is off the pool. Then there is a Raphis excelsa behind it in this raised bed, and then the acacias um, in the back, so over here. And then this bamboo is actually from the neighbor's property, but it was popping up through our fence. So. We basically just said, let's remove as much of it as we can. And then this wall was created to sort of hold back um, and sort of work with what we were given. So I think that was the theme of this project, work with what you were given. Um, this is the side view. You have some olives in the back. You have more of that acacia. And then we used DG wherever we could get away from using um, grass. So the backyard, we did a side, a little side yard off of the backyard where we installed this bocce port. The interesting thing was there were quite a bit of fruit trees and um, Japanese maples on the property that were still left. So we said they were already established. Why do we want to get rid of them? So we really worked around them. And if we were changing any of the grade around them with the new plantings, we would create these sort of cones um, around the base of some of these fruit trees and Japanese maples, and then raise the soil around them. So we have quite a bit of that. And then we just sort of disguised it with the boxwoods or these, um, this is a Corsican hellebore and some of this asparagus fern to sort of block that from happening. But really this was, kind of using the plants that had already established themselves and then creating this sort of new palette around it. So I was actually quite happy with that. And then I believe this is one of the last images. Um, this is a leucodendron from Africa. And I believe, I want to say it's Jester, but I don't think it is. Um, if you want to email me later, I could absolutely find out which one it is. But What's really wonderful about this is evergreen does really well in this tree 
situation because this is southwest facing. It gets brutal sun and everything is frying in there. So the solution was to put in this leucodendron that could handle the heat reflected off the building. And then we planted it with these anagazanthus, and this was, I believe, bush ranger. And this combination just did spectacular. Bed. So it was just really well draining because of the raised bed, but also um, the heat of the building just made these plants explode. So it was really wonderful. And then you can see in the back, we have the fruitless olives and then underplanted with actually some rather water hungry plants, which were these formiums and boxwoods because the soil is actually pretty clay in this part of Menlo Park. So anything that was raised or where we had the, um, the debris from the house being built, you know, contributed to the drainage, but the rest of the site, pretty wet. We were very lucky there. And um, I believe that's our conclusion. So thank you very much. Angela said, if there's any questions, um, we can go into that and um, I will let her take it from here. Thank you. Daniel, that was amazing. Um, lovely to see so many plants. Very interesting, so many Australian plants. Um, this morning I was actually writing to a nursery called Xantharea in Perth. <laughs> and um, I was thinking how they had actually changed the, 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 the name of their uh, nursery because people couldn't say it. And I was looking at it going, how do you say it? And here you were talking about it. It's so funny, you know, the universe just um, provides. So um, you didn't tell us about red though. So shall the we start red. there as a, the first question? Oh, red. You, you'll almost never see red in my gardens. Um, mm -hmm. And it's that one Dorianthes that has that red flower. I, I actively avoid it. Um, and then when it does flower, my clients absolutely freak out about that one flower because it's so prehistoric looking and you know then we cut it off and i never have to see red again but i just <laughs> find red in the garden jarring and not my favorite combination so okay. yellows and purples are seem to be my favorites yeah so everyone needs to know that daniel has already sent me a list of the 30 plants i think 30 plants your top performers because I think that there were there will be some questions which Maggie will now read from the chat um about possibly plant uh names that weren't coming across too too um clearly sure. but maybe in in hindsight possibly I should have sent that list out before so I think that's a, a learning curve for me because I think if you can see them then uh -huh. Um, possibly you can recognize them. Anyway, Maggie, why don't you take it away with the questions that came on the chat? Um, Daniel yes, I can do, Angela. Um, there wasn't much on the chat. There was a bit of a discussion about olives and whether they did well in California or not. And actually two of the attendees answered that and said that they're grown commercially as far as Reading in the Central Valley and in Oakland, California. So presumably there's no problem with olives. Um, there was a comment about how fantastic it was to design for with an aerial view of the garden. That's obviously something that, uh, depending on your setting, um, is, is, is a good idea. And uh, there was just a comment about um, the Monterey Cypress and whether people who are outside of California would recognise that. I don't know if you want to say anything about that one, Daniel. Well, what's interesting about Monterey Cypress is that they are they are overplanted in a lot of California, and we're having a problem with them falling over um, during our windstorms. Um, so it's not a great tree to see a lot in commercial use, um, where the nurseries are selling them, um, because whenever we have a windstorm, it's literally the first tree that comes down. So we um, we get alternatives to to cypress, but um, it's it's not a tree that you find a lot in, in commercial settings. 
Okay, um, there's another question. Have you used any lawn alternatives in your designs? Oh yeah, absolutely. So Damandia um, is a large one that we use quite a lot. It has a very tight, compact um, surface. It does the best if you have, for instance, like children or, you know, a dog, maybe not a huge dog, but, you know, a dog that's going to use that space pretty regularly. Um, it does need, it's interesting, I think it needs a little bit of water if you're going to plant it in full sun, but if you plant it in shade, it actually grows quite aggressively, um, or light shade, I would say, not deep, deep shade. And then the other one is, I mean, time also works, but the issue with time is you almost can only look at it it if you have like a lot of traffic on it it's not going to do well so it would be better if you were alternating with some sort of paver or flagstone in between but demandia does the best for me um and then leptinella is the third but leptinella is really hard to get um some people can find it but yeah it's something that if you see at the nursery you just sort of grab it and if you can get it great but those are sort of the top three but Demandi is the best. Okay, and, and somebody is um, is agreeing with you there and saying that they've found Demandi is really good at the Getty Center where there is heavy foot traffic and it's been there for years. So that's yeah. obviously an excellent recommendation. Um, that's all the questions on the chat at the moment, Angela. Okay. I have a question, Daniel. If uh, You mentioned a very there was a very pretty ag 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 agave um, Ephicrea was yeah, what I so, so there's agaves and then, well, there's aloes, there's agaves, and then there's ficreas. And oh, okay, sorry. Okay, so I'm mixing up. Okay. It was it was slightly, um, um, you know, variegated and slightly, looked very soft. Mm -hmm. It didn't look spiky. Um, mm -hmm. it, it was in the garden in Orinda, I think. Um, so there's a few above. There's a few of those. Um, so there's a Fucrea. Okay. Well, okay. So what's wonderful is that a agave and an aloe have similar qualities to a Fucrea. So they're going to have a little bit of that pliability to them. And they have a little less of that sort of very dark kind of aggressiveness of an agave. Mm -hmm. um, there are Fucrea fetida, which I believe is the one that you saw in the, oh, okay. in the garden. And that has a kind of wider um, leaf to it, and it's yeah. going to be solid green. And then there is Fucrea um, fetida variegata, and that's the yellow and green one. That okay. was also a few projects. And they that grow one, to about, what, one meter? It looked like... About, I would say that's about right, about three feet to three feet. Yeah. But what's interesting is that the green one does better if you're in colder climates. The variegated one does really only well in the city or if it's very protected. Okay. Um, then so that's a... And then there's a, the Fucrea McDouglii, which was in the last project, which is that very sculptural, striking one that gets, I mean, meters tall. I mean, yeah. if it's left on its own, it can almost become a small tree. That was the so. last one where there were three in the garden, which had very bad, uh, poor soil. Yeah. Very poor soil. Yes. Okay. Cool. And there's... to keep to keep that one small, we actually did a trick, and instead of planting it in the soil, we planted it in a grow pot mm -hmm. and then buried it. So basically to restrict the size of the root ball so it wouldn't get huge. And um, it worked for about 10 years. And then we took them out once they got a little bit too big for the space and just replaced them with three new ones. So it's been a, a really wonderful um, learning curve, but also when you see them, when they are just planted purely in the ground, they will develop almost like a palm structure where it's a trunk with, you know, the top. So beware. <laughs>
Okay. There's a follow-up on agaves from Chantelle who says that you talked about a tougher agave, but she didn't catch the name of the hybrid. Sure. So um, there is an agave attenuata hybrid, which is called agave blue flame. And it basically has a lot of that sort of wavy folding texture of the agave attenuata, but it does a lot, well, it performs much better in areas where we have some colder temperatures. So we can plant that one, I would say semi-reliably is maybe 50 miles north of San Francisco. Um, and it does really well. It does very well along the coast where it's particularly cooler. Um, it just doesn't want to get below freeze too often, but it will handle some light freezes occasionally, whereas opposed an attending model will just like liquefy. So it's um it's one of our better ones. No representative. I don't know if in, um is that, would anybody like to ask a question now in person? I don't really uh, okay, so um Marcia. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I would like to know what kind of box you showed in in one of your first gardens, box uh, boxwood. Um, I have fairly good luck in Southern California, but I'm just wondering what you used, what what that box was. I have um, Buxus japonica. Um, microphylla winter gem and that's pretty good but i'm i'm always looking for something better i have found that the dwarf olives are fabulous and i'm i have probably 40 boxwood and i'm slowly i have about 30 now because i'm getting used to these wonderful um olives which are great the dwarf dwarf olives and just require nothing whereas i seem to be feeding the boxwood more but anyway what what was that box you used. Well, I have to be honest and tell you, we removed those boxwoods maybe two years ago and we replaced them with the dwarf olives <laughs> because they were so much better. And the issue with them having to go up there and remind themselves to water every two weeks was too much. And I said, why are we holding these boxwoods, which actually came with the property? Um, I was like, let's just get rid of them. So there are just for, I think there were six or eight of them. And they were just in front of the house and we just pulled them out. So I'm right. saying what you're saying, which is basically stop fighting nature and, you know, replace with dwarf olives when you can. They're and fabulous. Yeah. They've yeah. done so much better. And the, the client didn't even know it was the best part. So <laughs> no, didn't that's, even tell them. that's great. <laughs> One more quick question. What was the leucospernum with the large yellow flower, I missed the word that came after it. Was it high something, leucospermin? That was towards the end of all your gardens with the beautiful it's yellow like flower. High gold is the name. High gold? Mm -hmm. Okay, That's got right. it. Thank you. Um, and thank if you. In Los Angeles, oh, I'm just gonna yeah. say one more thing. If yeah. you're in Los Angeles, Flora Grubb opened a nursery at the, Marina, at the old Marina Del Rey Garden Center. So if you're in the area, you can go to her nursery, which is in Marina Del Rey, and they carry a lot of the plants that are on the list, particularly that Lucas Fermo. Oh, so. great. Thank you. Thank you. That's close. Yes, thank you. Okay. Joseph uh, Milius, hi. Hi, yes. Yeah, thanks for the um Thanks for the chat, Daniel. It was great and nice to see so many uh, Australian plants in there. That was a, a nice little surprise. Um, I'm actually. Where, in... where are you? Are you sitting? You're not sitting in Australia, are you? I'm not actually. No, the time difference is better here. I'm in Denmark at present, so it's uh, not so not such an early morning uh, as some of the Australians that I think were hoping to to tune in. But I'm sure they'll see the recording. Um, I had a question that I guess I hope doesn't deviate too much from the scope of the society here, but I was wondering, in a lot of your um, descriptions of the gardens, you were mentioning that the brief from clients was really low maintenance. That seemed to be a, a repeated feature that, that people were wanting things that maybe they weren't gardeners themselves. Would your choice of um, the planting palette be particularly different for gardens that, um, you know, where you had the, the capacity to to plant things regardless of their maintenance requirements or are you finding that um it's uh, built into all of your gardens anyway now there's this idea of, of somewhat low maintenance and and that's a continuing brief yeah I think it's a good question most of my clients come to me because that's what they want 
if they, they want a low maintenance garden. Um, and there's no such thing I tell them as low as no maintenance, like you'll get less maintenance, but everything still does require maintenance. Um, if they want edibles, if they want flowers, I will happily send them to one of the designers that I work with and are friends with that can do those. But it's really difficult for me to, for instance, do an edible garden when all I want to do is plant xanthoreas and mastringias and you know, bangs is. So I, I, I tell them what's really, I think sort of my strength is a lot of the gardens that I design look almost the same throughout the year. Um, and that's based off of the plant palette, but also the evergreen quality that I like in a lot of plants. And I find that using a lot of ornamental or edible plants where you get those exotic flowers or you, know, you get this fruit for two weeks, it's, the range isn't really worth the payback of um, you know, the aesthetic that I think I want, the consistency. So I, most of my clients are saying, we want as low maintenance, as drought tolerant as possible. And I've just sort of, yeah, created this sort of business around it. So mm. I've been fortunate. Fantastic. Respect. That helps answer your question. Indeed, thank you. Um, Daniel, there's just mm -hmm. a couple more things have just popped up on the chat as you've been talking. Um, one is, what is the name of the Marina del Rey nursery? Oh, sure, it's Flora Grub. So okay. F L O R A, and then it's Grub with two Bs. What's a lovely name for a nursery? <laughs> and then the other question is, what is the white calanco? Calanchua. The white one. So it's called um, Rose Leaf is the name. And it's very hard to find. It just came out. Um, Flora Grub in Los Angeles and San Francisco does carry it because they are growing it themselves. But it is a three foot tall and very dense calanchoe that doesn't have that very kind of like monstera looking leaf that we typically think of with most count codes. Okay, thank you. Wonderful. That's it for now on the chat. Anybody else? Well, it was fantastic to, to, to join you in that um, tour of these lovely projects. And thank you very much for, for sharing your um, creativity and your um, inspiration with us. I have got the uh, plant list as I said so I will send that out um, tomorrow morning um, to you all um, and that will obviously probably then and possibly maybe if we go on the website for Flora Grub we could actually does she have good plant profiles she does she has a very good, um, yeah. she has a wonderful website yeah and the other tip I would do is mm -hmm. her growing grounds her business is called Grub and Nadler. So it's G-R-U-B-B -B and Nadler. Mm -hmm. And they post their availability list. Mm -hmm. So you can go and look online and mm -hmm. see what they grow. And um, it's it's quite interesting. So because yeah. we might you know, some of us will be more <clears throat> au fait with with some of the, the, the plants, but it's always good to just have a look and see mm -hmm. the size and, and what they like and so on. So together with those two things, we will off, we will be presumably planting some new stuff in our gardens. Thank well, you so much, Daniel. It was great to meet you. And uh, thank you for sharing this hour and a half with us. It's very, been very valuable, very interesting. Well, thank you very much. I'm sure thank everyone you. will join me in thanking you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you, everybody. See you next month.